Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, my name is Shane McDowell. I, uh, I am from Chatham, uh, originally from London, if you know the area. Uh, and so, yeah, very excited to be here. Um, sorry it's under these circumstances, but I'm glad to join you in worship. Uh, I, uh, I come by here all, not all the time, regularly. I work for Enbridge, which was the old Union Gas, uh, and we have a plant just um, right outside of Lobo. And so I, I frequent that, and this is how I come up. Uh, my wife, uh, my wife and I differ on how we should drive to London. She likes to take number two up. Uh, and I like to come up through here, um, through Glencoe. And so I said, when we got in the car this morning, I said, okay, we're, we're going up through Glencoe. And she just rolls her eyes and sighs, and she's like, oh, we have to go that way. Straight there. Like, you just you go right past it. So, anyways, thank you for having me. And, uh, and thank you for, for joining uh, both churches here in worship. Uh, this was thrown together a little last minute, so the bulletin will use it as a rough guide this morning. Uh, I will sort through the pieces we can follow and those that we're going to change a little bit, so uh, I ask for a little bit of grace uh, in that, and we'll, uh, we'll get you through this. Uh, this morning, we are going to, we're going to talk about something that almost every biblical character deals with from time to time. Uh, Jesus deals with it. God even deals with it. Uh, the psalmists love it. Uh, although it happens enough in the psalms, we don't like to talk about this. Uh, they're called psalms of complaint. And none of them show up in Voices United, so we like to just skip over all of it. But this is this idea of lament. And this sitting with our emotions and sitting with God in these times that are a little more troubling than, than we'd like them to be. So that's what we're going to, to do today. We can, we can deal with lament in a couple of different ways. We can, we can sing, we can pray, we can sit in silence, uh, and we'll talk through some of that as we go through our service this morning. We light our Christ candle as a reminder that God is in this place and God is in each one of us. By lighting it, we're reminded of the nearness of God to us at all times. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge the sacred land on which we now sit. This is the land of the Chippewa of the Thames. We sit in the dish with one spoon territory. And the dish with one spoon is a treaty that bound the indigenous nations to share the territory and to protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in a spirit of peace and friendship and respect. The dish represents what is now Southern Ontario. We all eat out of the dish, that is, we all share this territory with only one spoon. It means that we must share the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty, which includes caring for the land and all of the creatures in it. So today, this land is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live here. We are also mindful of the broken covenants and the need to strive to make things right with all our relations. The original nations continue to cry out for justice, and as a treaty people, we commit to listen and learn and work towards justice and reconciliation. And I will ask you to join our voices in our opening hymn, which will be 374. 
Come and find the quiet center. Three, seven, four.
pray together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let the children be fed first, 
for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For that, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him a deaf man who had an uh, impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And he took him aside in, a pri in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed, and he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more they zealously proclaimed it. And they were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And now I'll ask you to join me in our responsive song. Uh, we're going to read Psalm 15, and that's on page 736. In your voices united. Now this is a song, uh, I chose this one because uh, the first line are, are basically, how can I get into your tent, how can I come to worship, and then it's a listing of, of the things that are, are important to God, and they're not, they're not what we might expect them to be. I am going to play the tune through first, and say, okay. So we get to Mark, we had to read Mark before we got there, 
And he, he talked for about an hour or so, and then he said, does anyone have any questions? Yep, I've got a couple of things. What's going on with the Syrophoenician woman, and why does Jesus treat her like that? Why does Jesus sigh before he heals the deaf man? And why does Jesus keep telling everyone not to tell anyone what they've seen? Those were my three things. Most of the class left around 9 o'clock. I left around 1.30. And to this day, I have no idea what's going on with the Syrophoenician woman. I don't know why Jesus sighed. And I don't know why in Mark, Jesus always tells people not to tell anyone that he's healed them. But here's what I did know, or what I did learn about that conversation. That if something happens all the time, pay attention to it. And if something happens once, definitely pay attention to it. Jesus calling a woman a dog only happens once. Jesus sighs only once. This is a really tricky passage. And it's, it, it's not obvious to a lot of people what's happening or what's going on. Matthew also tells the story a little bit differently, but just as confusing. So I want to I want to just let's start at the basics on why this is why this is so controversial. So we have a woman who's alone, meaning she has no uh, male companion. She's approaching another male in a house alone. And he's a stranger. She is a Gentile, which means she's not a Jew, uh, which means that she shouldn't know who Jesus is. He should not be anything special to her. And not only is she not a Jew, but she's a Syrophoenician woman. And that probably doesn't mean a lot to us. In Matthew, she's called a Canaanite woman. Not only are these people not Jewish, they're ancient enemies of Israel. At one point, these people were at war with Israel. And I'm sure that there's still some hostility between the people. We also know that she has uh, a demonic daughter. And we don't know what that means. We don't, we don't get any detail about what's wrong with her. But from other people who have had demons, this is not a person you would take out of the house. So we know that this poor lady is probably stuck in her house with her daughter who has, has some illness. By the culture of the day, there is no reason why this encounter should have even happened. This woman should not know who Jesus was. She should not care who Jesus is. There's, there's no way that this should have even taken place. So it, it begs a lot of questions. And when we get into researching this, there's basically two schools of thought on what's happening between Jesus and this woman. The first one is a group of people who like to explain away. So basically what Jesus is saying is, why would I heal you? I should be... I should be healing and working for the Jewish people, the Israelites. Um, and, and that's where this gets contentious. So one group says that Jesus is trying to, or they try and explain away what Jesus says. They say he's making a joke. He's being sarcastic. Uh, maybe he's testing her. Maybe he's just making a point uh, in this story. Some even say that maybe this part was actually added later and Jesus never said these things. Then you have the other school of thought who says, under no circumstances should you try and explain away what Jesus said. That what Jesus said is what Jesus said, and it's in Scripture. So they may come across as racist, <laughs> prejudiced, sexist. Maybe Jesus was having a bad day, he wanted to be alone, and she wouldn't let him. Maybe 
Jesus is trying to figure out his ministry. Maybe at this point, he doesn't know that he should be including Gentiles, the outsiders, into his ministry. Obviously, I don't have an answer for it. What I will tell you is this story is extremely messy. It's confusing. It's convoluted. There's pieces of it that I really wish weren't in it. That I really wish Jesus wouldn't have said these things. It's emotional. We see some raw human emotion from both the woman and Jesus. It's a little, it's a little uncomfortable. It doesn't sit right with me. And these are all really good reasons to preach on something else. To choose another story. And as much as I wanted to ignore this, and I really, really did. Something wouldn't let me. I have a feeling that we may be, that this story may be relatable, and that it's messy. We don't know the right answer. We're in a place we didn't want to be. None of the options seem particularly good. And we're in a place that's extremely emotional. I thought maybe that might sit here today. That we might relate to that kind of story. So then I thought, well, how do I approach this story? Instead of trying to work on the details, how would I go about talking about this story? And I want to pull out something that's incredibly important, that if we get really worked into the details, we'll miss. That we are being invited into a relationship with a God who is active, who is compassionate, and who is listening. We're invited into a relationship with a God who is working in the world, working through us. He's hearing the things we want to say and seeing the things that we are. And he's listening and compassionate. In this story, the emotions are honest. They're real, they're sincere from this woman, and we don't know anything, we don't know anything about how she's actually talking to Jesus. Is she frustrated? Is she sad? Is she desperate? Is she angry? Is she yelling at Jesus? Is she accusing Jesus? Is she ashamed because she most likely thinks that this is her fault? But there's something very sacred. There's something very holy in bringing all of this to God. We have this long history. Our tradition has a long history of what we would call lament which today we might think of that more as complaining or whining, but that's not at all what it is in the Bible. From some of the very first pages, we get people who are lamenting to God. They're wishing the way things are now are not how they were supposed to be. They're wishing that they didn't have to do what they were doing right now. But this lament, And this comes from, this, come, this lament comes from, God made a promise in Deuteronomy, in some of the earliest pages. He said, if you do the things that I'm telling you to do, good things will happen. You'll get blessed. 
And if you do, if you don't do what I'm commanding you, you'll be cursed. And everybody was okay with that at the time. They thought that's that sounds fair. But slowly, they found over time that bad things were happening to good people. And good things were happening to bad people. And they said, wait a second, God. This isn't what we agreed to. We didn't say that you are not holding up your end of the deal here. And as much as we don't like that, that happens a lot in the Bible. Like I said, there are psalms about it that you won't find in here because we don't like to talk about it. Job is a great example who gets sick and his friends keep telling you, you must have done something. And Job says, I didn't. This is the classic story of good things happening to bad people. We have Micah and Amos who see wealthy people do awful things to people and get wealthier. And we see poor people who are getting the brunt of the wealthy people. We have this long history. We seem to have forgotten that. It's something that we've lost, this, this ability to tell God that we're not happy with what's going on. Lamentation isn't this complaining or whining. It's an uncensored communion with God. It's where we learn to be intimate and honest, and we acknowledge that things aren't the way that they should be, and we invite God, we ask God in different ways and in different intensities to respond with justice and righteousness. And by allowing this by allowing this sacred space between us and God, we allow it, we, we are given the opportunity to understand that life is complex. That it's not as simple as some people make it out to be. And from time to time, we're going to have to deal with issues. But if we don't take this time, we lose out on the opportunity to be real and to be honest in front of God. It's a time for us to say, I don't have all the answers, or I don't know what will happen next. It's a time to say, I wish that didn't happen, or I wish I didn't do that. Somehow we get this idea that being Christians and following God accepts us from hardship, or pain, or anger, or doubt, or all of these emotions that we face on any given day. But when we, when we come to God as our true selves, we create this space, and like I said, it is a sacred space, where we come face to face with God, where we can be honest, and God can be loving. One of the earliest covenants between God and his people. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And sometimes a loving God who understands us and listens to us is God being our God. So I want to use this story, and I want to pause us a little. At the end of the story, the little girl is here. We know that. But before we jump there, I want to pause us right in the middle. Because I think this is where we are. Where the woman comes to Jesus and says, I don't like the way things are. And God says, no. God says, not yet.
and I don't like saying that. That's a really hard thing for me to say that, that God says no. But here we sit, with all of that emotion, with whatever that poor woman is feeling. And it's our job now to sit and have that conversation with God. That's the next move. It's not to jump to the healing or wish we had the healing. It's to sit and talk and be honest and be real. Because we are invited into a relationship with a God who is active, who is compassionate, and who is listening. with those who need them so badly, 
it would not be enough. If we could share our faith and our love with those who need a spiritual life and a home, it would not be enough to thank you, God, for all that you have given us. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, silence us. Silence us to the world that buzzes around us and convinces us that positivity and happiness can drive away all of the hurt and doubt we experience. This is not being human. Open us to your stillness, God, to enter into that holy space where you sit in patience and love, and we bring everything that we are. Sometimes we ourselves don't even know what that is, but we come honestly and trusting in your goodness. Silence that small voice inside us that is afraid to look. The one that tries to shove us back into reality and away from the quiet of our sacred space. It keeps us from knowing you. And it halts the healing that is so desperately needed. We search for answers, but understand that lamenting provides real few answers to our questions. Instead, we find both discomfort and relief in the quietness and the honesty in which we sit. As your church, it seems that we've tried to protect our identity of strength and faithfulness. We are the ones who are supposed to be the hopeful in times of despair, the comfort in times of sorrow, the faithful in times of doubt, and the rock in the chaos. But God, by not allowing honesty to have a place in our lives, by acting out this charade that everything is and will be okay, this makes us less comforting. When we should be sitting and weeping together, we can say things that are unhelpful and hurtful because we are the strong ones with all the answers. When we should be embracing all of our human emotions, including grief and confusion, we come with positivity. When we should be coming to you, God, in trust, allowing you into all parts of our being, we put on a brave face. We don't think or we don't understand or recognize that being a Christian can be complicated. Remind us that we can be faithful and fear. We can sing in sorrow and we can weep and worship. Silence us, God, so that we can hear the suffering in our community and our church family. Slow us down to recognize the grief, the pain, and the ongoing sorrow and injustices in the places where we live and work. We especially lift up this morning Molly, Ken, Grace, Liz, Eileen, Sharon, 
John, Howard, Pam, Jim, Jesse, Fred, Megan, and Sharon and her family. There are many in our communities, God, that enter the darkness every day to ease the burden of those who are struggling. Through community programs, many have found new life when they thought all hope was lost. Many have found protectors when they thought they were alone. We pray this morning for those who bring comfort to those in need to those with broken hearts, those who feel helpless, are betrayed, and those who regret. Your love surrounds us in all that we do, loving God. Be with us today, human God, as we weep, celebrate, are angered or frustrated, and are joyful. In our health and our illness, in our pain and our comfort, we sit with you today, peaceful in your presence. Amen. As you leave this place, I hope, I pray, that you find that place of comfort and peace and honesty with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the God who loves us and comforts us, may he go with you this day in everything that you say and do. And our sung benediction will be, go now in peace. Oh